For almost the entirety of NBA history, the MVP voting has followed a very specific formula that they very rarely diverge from. For one, you need to be on an elite winning team. Number two, you have to have really nice stats, but not necessarily the best stats as long as you're winning a lot. And number three, you have to have a nice story to the season. Specifically, to really emphasize how important winning is to the formula, listen to this. In the past 30 years of NBA basketball, every single MVP winner has finished in the standings as a top two team in his conference, with the exception of one, which was Russell Westbrook in 2017, who was the first player to average a triple-double since 1962. So unless you can do something that's so incredibly historic that it breaks the formula, you're not winning MVP unless your team is an elite winning team. But is this fair? Is this really the most accurate way to gauge a player's value? Many people don't think so, and think that the award too strongly favors players on elite teams rather than who's honestly the best player or the most valuable player in a literal sense. So what if we said screw the formula, and instead just gave the award to the player who was literally that season's best player? Well, things would change up quite a bit. It's worth noting that until the 1980s season, the players were the ones who did the voting and decided the MVP winner, unlike today, which is decided mostly by members of the media. Who's really better to ask than the players themselves on who was the best or who was the most valuable player? Probably no one. So is it somewhat arrogant of me to disagree with some of their choices and suggest my own? Sure, but many of you have been requesting this video. So you know what? The show goes on! Today, the decade we're looking at is the 1970s, and let me know in a comment if you agree or disagree with these choices. In 1970, the New York Knicks finished with the best record in the regular season, and their own Willis Reed was narrowly named the league MVP, and on this new list, he loses the award to Jerry West. Willis was a 6'9 center slash power forward, whose impact on the league has become somewhat overlooked from the greats of the 60s and 70s. At this point, he was 27 years old and in the prime of his career, as the tandem of him and Walt Frazier dominated the league this season. Willis put up an impressive 21.7 points, 13.9 rebounds, and two assists on 50.7% shooting while also making first-team all-defense. Although this was a great season from an individual standpoint, it's likely that his peers' voting patterns were influenced by the Knicks' overall success, because even though the Lakers won 14 less games than the Knicks, it's pretty clear that from a production standpoint that West clearly stood out in that battle, as Jerry put up a strong 31.2 points, 7.5 assists, and 4.6 rebounds on 49.7% shooting. He was first in scoring, fourth in assists, he was 15th overall in field goal percentage, even though he was playing as a perimeter shooter. He was first in win shares, he had the highest player efficiency rating, and he was the best defender at his position as he was named first team all defense. If steals per game had been tracked at this point in the NBA, then he may have led the league in those as well, as West had a reputation of being one of the best pickpockets in the entire league. Now Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who at the time was Lou Alcindor, finished third overall in the actual MVP voting. And you could certainly argue that he should have won the award this season as he put up his typical monstrous numbers. But unlike Weston Reed, Kareem didn't make first team all defense. Therefore, West keeps his edge. But Kareem's time was approaching quickly and in a major way. In 1971, Lou Alcindor slash Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was named the league MVP. And he's keeping the award ahead of Jerry West and John Havlicek. The 1971 Bucks are remembered as one of the great teams of NBA history, as Kareem led them to a 66-win season behind numbers of 31.7 points, 16 rebounds, and 3.3 assists on 57.7% shooting. He was second-team all-defense as he led the league in scoring, he was second in field goal percentage, he was third in rebounds, and he dominated the rest of the league in most advanced stats, including win shares and PER. Other players had great seasons as well, like Jerry West and John Havlicek, who put up impressive stat lines. But the truth is, it didn't matter which angle you take this season. From an individual standpoint, from an impact standpoint, and from a team standpoint, no one was close to Kareem's greatness this season. In 1972, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was again named the league MVP, and he's keeping the award ahead of Jerry West and Wilt Chamberlain. This was a historic season between two juggernaut teams, the Lakers with Jerry West, Gil Goodrich, and Wilt Chamberlain, and the Bucks with Kareem and Oscar Robertson. The 72 Lakers are recognized as one of the greatest teams in NBA history, as they won a league record at the time 69 games, and also set the NBA record with 33 straight wins, a mark that still stands to this day. 
Wilt Chamberlain was a major reason for their success, as his rebounding and outlet passes was the engine that drove their fast break offense. He did it to the tune of 14.8 points, 19.2 rebounds, and 4 assists on a tremendous 64.9% shooting. He was also the league's greatest rim protector at the time as he made first team all defense. West did his part as well, averaging over 25 points, a league leading 9.7 assists per game and 4.2 rebounds on 47.7% shooting. Even with all of their collective success, and even with their MVP caliber performances, Kareem still stands out, as he averaged video game numbers of 34.8 points, 16.6 rebounds, and 4.6 assists on 57.4% shooting. He led the Bucks to win 63 games, and they were actually the team that snapped the Lakers' 33-game winning streak. Chamberlain was technically more efficient from the field, but not nearly enough to overlook the fact that Kareem averaged 20 more points. And when you include free throw percentage, the gap becomes very marginal as they had nearly the same true shooting percentage. All that goes to say is that despite the Lakers getting the last laugh, Kareem clearly deserved the award this year. In 1973, Dave Cowens won the MVP, but he's losing the award once again to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Now even though the players were the ones doing the voting at this point, they had a lot of the same voting tendencies as the media members do today, and that's to often reward the MVP to the best player from the best team. In this case, this was the underrated Dave Cowens, as the big man led his Celtics to the league's best record with plenty of 20 point and 20 rebound nights. As good as Cowens was, Kareem was 5 inches taller, more skilled offensively, and just a greater overall athlete. And individually, he absolutely destroyed Cowens from a production standpoint as Kareem put up 30, 16, and 5 on 55% shooting. But there was another player who seriously challenged Kareem this season, and that was Nate Tiny Archibald. The 6'1 point guard was skilled in so many ways. He was a quick, shifty guard with incredible vision, he was one of the greatest ball handlers of his era, and he was a lethal scorer, who would slash to the basket and was elite at finishing around the rim. He was very crafty, using his high basketball IQ to get himself to his sweet spots. This season, Archibald put up a ridiculous 34 points, 11.4 assists, and 2.8 rebounds on 48.8% shooting. Remarkably, he led the league in scoring and assists, as he was almost the entire offense for his Kansas City Kings. He was leaned upon so much offensively that he played a league-leading 46 minutes per game. His Kings only won 36 games, but he was certainly the man who carried them to just about all of them. So you could certainly make a case for the award to go to Archibald, but for me, ultimately the edge goes to Kareem, whose elite impact was on both sides of the basketball, which was the key factor for their winning success. In 1974, Kareem was named the league MVP once again in a very close race, and on this new list, he's barely keeping the award ahead of Bob McAdoo. Once again, Kareem led his Bucks to a very successful year as they won 59 games with Abdul-Jabbar skyhooking his way to averages of 27 points, 14.5 rebounds, 4.8 assists, 1.4 steals, and 3.5 blocks on 53.9% shooting. Bob McAdoo, on the other hand, was only in his sophomore season, and as a 22-year-old, the 6'9 center broke out in a major way, averaging over 30 points, over 15 rebounds, 2.3 assists, 1.2 steals, and 3.3 blocks on 54.7% shooting. McAdoo was one of the first stretch bigs, and with his solid footwork and his smooth jump shot, he was dominating the competition from an extremely young age. He led the Buffalo Braves to a 42-40 record, and with numbers similar to Kareem's, you could certainly argue that he was the best offensive player this season. But Kareem was once again first-team all-defense, as he was also second in the league in block shots. Therefore, Abdul-Jabbar continues his dominance of the award. In 1975, Bob McAdoo was named the league's MVP, and he's keeping the award ahead of Kareem and Rick Barry. McAdoo was only 23 years old and greatly improved his Braves to a 49-33 record, while dropping 34.5 points, 14.1 rebounds, 2.2 assists, and 2.1 blocks on 51.2% shooting. This was one of the more efficient, great scoring seasons of basketball history, as he not only averaged nearly 35 points while shooting over 50%, but he also shot 80.5% from the free throw line, which is incredible for someone who plays the center position. He had by far the highest amount of win shares that season, and no one was close to his scoring output. Pretty remarkable stuff for a big man who did a major part of his scoring from the mid-range or beyond. Now Kareem did his usual thing, as he had one of the greatest individual seasons for a guy who didn't win the MVP award. 
It didn't translate to much winning though, as this was his first season after Oscar Robertson's retirement, so the shorthanded Bucks only had 38 victories and missed the playoffs. Honorable mention goes to Rick Barry, whose stat line looks very similar to prime Kobe Bryant numbers, as his Warriors won 48 games and eventually the NBA championship. As impressive as his regular season was, the players who voted got it right, as McAdoo was simply on another level that regular season. In 1976, Kareem took his award back, as he was once again named the MVP, and he's keeping the award slightly ahead of Bob McAdoo. In Kareem's first season after being traded to the Los Angeles Lakers, the highly motivated big man put up a monstrous campaign of 27.7 points, 16.9 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4.1 blocks on 52.9% shooting. He was second in the league in scoring, first in rebounds, 15th overall in assists, and he led the league in block shots by a wide margin. He made his regular appearance on the NBA's All-Defense team, and he also had top honors in win shares and player efficiency rating. He did improve his team from the previous season, but they only finished with a 40-42 and 42 record, making him only the second player in NBA history to win the MVP award while playing for a losing team. That's how good he was individually that season. McAdoo once again put up a tremendous fight in another great regular season, as he led the Braves to 46 wins and yet another playoff appearance. But with that being said, no one impacted the game in as many ways as Kareem did that year. In 1977, Kareem won the MVP yet again, and he's keeping the award as he was clearly this season's most complete player. By his standards, this was relatively a pretty tame season for the 29-year-old Kareem, as he put up over 26 points, 13 rebounds, 4 assists, and 3 blocks on 57.9% shooting. The captain was second team all defense, and really, there's not much to be said that hasn't already been said about him. He was basically the original model of consistency and longevity, and he was seemingly in the MVP conversation just about every season. Probably the guy who gave Kareem the greatest opposition this season was Pistol Pete Maravich, who was the driving force of his New Orleans Jazz offense. He was lethal on the fast break, he had an incredible handle of the basketball, and he was one of the best perimeter shooters at his time. He led the league in scoring that season, as he put up 31.1 points, 5.1 rebounds, and 5.4 assists on 43.3% shooting. Now that efficiency isn't terrible for a perimeter shooting guard, but when the guy you're going up against is nearly 60% from the field, it's difficult to overlook. Combine that with the fact that Kareem was either the best or second best rim protector at the time, and it's easy to see why the big man keeps the award. In 1978, Bill Walton was the league's MVP, as he led the Blazers most of the way to 58 wins. But on this new list, he loses the award to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Bill is one of the forgotten great big men of NBA history, whose career would have been so much better if it hadn't been for his numerous injuries. With that being said, this was his year and the year of his Blazers, as they not only had a successful regular season, but also went on to win the NBA championship. Walton had many skills, as he was a terrific passer, a great rebounder, and an elite shot blocker. On the regular season, he averaged 18.9 points, 13.2 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2.5 blocks on 52.2% shooting. Now what's interesting is how Walton's peers voted him as the MVP, despite the fact that he dealt with injuries this season and only played in 58 games. Due to this, of the 14 players who got MVP votes this season, Walton only ranked in 11th place in win shares. Now with that being said, my choice for the award is Kareem, who also only played in 62 games that season, yet despite that, Kareem was still second among MVP candidates in win shares. When you look at their stats next to each other, you could see that Kareem averaged nearly 10 more points, more blocks, and was significantly more efficient from both the field and the free throw line. It's hard to say whether or not voter fatigue played a role in the players picking Walton over Kareem, but from a pure production standpoint, it's Kareem and it's not even close. Now as far as Abdul-Jabbar playing in only 62 games, there was other MVP candidates who played a full season, but in terms of all-around impact and production, it's a major drop-off between Kareem and the rest of the crowd. I will say that 1978 is easily the weakest group of MVP candidates of this decade. With Kareem missing as many games as he did, it might be seen as a bit controversial to some, but I think he takes the award. In 1979, Moses Malone of the Houston Rockets was named the NBA's MVP, and he's keeping the award slightly ahead of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. 
I've said it in past videos, but in my opinion, Moses Malone is the most underrated center in NBA history. And in 1979, the 23-year-old center had a season for the ages as he put up 24.8 points, an absurd 17.6 rebounds, 1.8 assists, and 1.5 blocks on 54% shooting. He was also second team all defense. Now his 17.6 rebounds was incredible enough in itself, but it actually gets even more impressive than that. Moses was a beast at battling for rebound position on the offensive end, and he's likely the greatest offensive rebounder in NBA history. In that area, there was no season greater than this one, as he averaged 7.2 offensive rebounds per game. That's the highest recorded average for a season of all time, and from an impact standpoint, that is a ton of second chance opportunities to give your team on a nightly basis. Kareem had yet another MVP-worthy season as he was just entering his early 30s. But when you consider all the different variables and the way Moses dominated the boards on a historic level, I think he overwhelmingly deserves it this season. Here's a quick recap of who originally won the award and who wins under this new format. Do you agree with the list? Let me know in the comments section which ones you think I got right and which ones you think I got wrong. Thanks for watching as always, make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.